we're going to have a look at a systematic method for solving linear equations. By linear equations, I mean a set of equations like this, where the coefficients c11, c12, and so on are numerical constants, and the subscriptive x terms are variables. An example might be the equations 4x1 minus x2 equal to 1, and minus 2x1 plus 3x2 equal to 12. Here we have two equations with two unknowns. I'm going to write the unknowns as x and y. There needs to be the same number of equations as unknowns in order to represent a unique solution. For example, the first constraint by itself gives an infinite number of solutions, represented by the line y equals 4x minus 1. By adding the second constraint, we can substitute the result for y in, and this gives a single equation to solve for x, with the solution x equals 3 over 2, corresponding to y equals 5. By considering the geometry of two straight lines, we can see that two equations in two unknowns will always have a unique solution, unless the two lines are parallel. If the lines are parallel and distinct, then there'll be no solutions, because there's no points that lie on both lines. And if the two equations represent the same line, then there'll be an infinite number of solutions. Later, we'll look at the conditions for a unique solution of a system of n equations in n unknowns. The important thing for now is to recognise that we do need the same number of equations as unknowns. For example, let's consider the system x plus y plus 2z equals 2, I'll call that equation 1, and 2x plus 3y minus 4z equal to 1, that's equation 2. From equation 1 we can get x in terms of y and z. And by substituting this into equation 2, we get one equation in two unknowns. We could rearrange this second equation to get y all in terms of z, and so you can see that again there are an infinite number of solutions. This is known as an underdetermined system. If I now add a third equation though, minus x plus y plus z equal to 3, then we can again substitute the result for x in from equation 1. And we now have two equations in two unknowns. We could rearrange one of these equations to get y all in terms of z, and substitute it into the other, and then we'll have a single equation for z to solve, from which we get z equals 11 over 19, corresponding to y equals 31 over 19, and x equals minus 15 over 19. We're going to solve this system of equations shortly. If we tried to add a fourth equation in terms of x, y, and z, for example, x plus 2y plus z equals to 4, then it would be very unlikely that the solutions for x, y, and z would also satisfy this fourth equation, and so there'd be no solutions of the full system of four equations. Cases like this are known as overdetermined systems. In this tutorial, we're only going to consider cases where there are the same number of equations as unknowns, and I'm going to assume that this gives a unique solution, although, as I've said, this is not always the case. Let's now have a look at a different method for solving this system of equations. What we're going to do is we're going to use the first equation to eliminate x from equations 2 and 3. I'll do this by taking equation 2 and subtracting 
two lots of equation one. And by taking equation three and adding equation one. This gives the results y minus 8z equal to minus 3 and 2y plus 3z equal to 5. That's two equations now in two unknowns. We can keep going and use equation 2 to eliminate y from equation 3 now. We'll do equation 3 minus 2 times equation 2. And that gives 19z equals 11. So we can now read the solution for z from the third equation. We can substitute that back into equation 2 to get the result for y. And we can use the results for y and z together to get the result for x from equation 1. We only used two operations here, and those were to multiply any equation by a constant and to add any two equations together. We were also able to combine these two operations into a single step, which is to add multiples of one equation to another. Notice that these operations don't affect the variables, they only affect the coefficients, and so it's convenient to collect the coefficients together in a table, or an array. I'm going to do that for the set of three equations here. First we write down the x coefficients, then the y coefficients, and the z coefficients. We also need to know what the constant terms on the right side are. and I'll separate these from the left-hand side of the equation by a dashed line. This table of values is called the augmented matrix. Now using just the matrix of coefficients we can follow the same manipulations that we did with the full set of equations. For example we can use the first equation to eliminate x from the second and the third equations. We're going to do row 2 minus 2 times row 1, and we're going to do row 3 plus row 1. The first row isn't going to be changed. For the second row, we get 0 here, we get 3 minus 2 times 1 here, which gives us 1, minus 4 minus 2 times 2, that's minus 8, and 1 minus 2 times 2, that's minus 3. In the third row, we get 0, 2, 3, and 5. Notice that these equations are the same as the ones that we arrived at above. We have y minus 8z equal to minus 3 and we have 2y plus 3z equal to 5. Now we're going to eliminate y from the third equation. So we'll do this by subtracting two lots of row 2. Again, this is the same result that we arrived at above. We have 19 lots of z equal to 11. The form that we've arrived at now is called upper triangular form. 
because the coefficients on the left side of the augmented matrix form a triangle in the upper part of the array. We have all zeros below the leading diagonal, which is what we were looking for. We could solve this system of equations now by back substitution to get z, y and x. From the third equation we have z equals 11 over 19. The second equation says that y minus 8z equals to minus 3 and since we know z now we can use that to get y. From the first equation we have x plus y plus 2z equal 2 and the results for z and y from these two equations can be used to get x. But instead of doing that I'm going to press on with the algorithm and get zeros above the leading diagonal as well so that we'll be able to read off the results for x, y and z directly. We now want to use the third row which features only z to eliminate z from the first two rows. So we're going to do row 2 plus 8 nineteenths of row 3 and we're going to do row 1 minus 2 nineteenths of row 3. Only the values that have left blank are going to be affected by these operations. It's equivalent to substituting the result for z into equations 1 and 2. We're going to get zeros here, and on the right side things get a little bit messy. At this point we've finished using the third row and so it's convenient to divide this row by 19 so that we can read off the solution for z. We want to use the second row to get a zero in the first row for the y value. So we want row 1 minus row 2. At this point, we would normally have to divide the second and the first rows by whatever values appeared here, but since those are already 1, we're finished. And we can read off the solutions which are x equals minus 15 over 19, y equals 31 over 19, and z equals 11 over 19. This form of the array is called row-reduced echelon form.